there were some common themes in there for me, but I'm not going to hog the questions. If somebody immediately wants to jump in, otherwise I will, um, I will start off. But thank you very much for interesting and real-world examples. You're actually all deeply making things and involved in making things. Um, if there isn't an immediate sort of starting question. I would ask you, I'd ask you both, actually, both sets of you. Um, so lots of challenges in there. Um, what was the single biggest challenge, and what did you learn from it in developing what you've done so far on, let's start with art player, not TV? Well, I think, I think, I think the biggest challenge was actually finding the right partners to work with, which indicated for us a good spread of organisations across the sector. That was, that was interesting. Um, I mean, fact as a kind of technology provider had has a fair amount of resource at its hands in terms of what it can. Uh, building the platform, uh, providing services to film events, record events. But yeah, I think probably finding the right partners is the key thing, like as, 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 as in life. <laughs> oh, we've got into Zen philosophy, that was good. Um, so how, um, how, um, how do you go about it then? Well, we looked around, really. I mean, obviously the first protocol is to see what people are doing with their own websites. We wanted to keep it local as well, um, initially in the first phase. As I said, the art player um, platform sort of spread over three phases. Um, the third phase being sort of very reasonably big, well-established national organisations. The second phase, phase being um, uh, organisations that are creating content, a fair amount of content, but not, not necessarily with somewhere to put it. Right. But the first phase being... Um, keep it local, keep it a, a good spread of activity, keep and, and go out and meet and make sure you get on. Okay. So uh, I think that's probably one for you, isn't it? Yeah, Major okay. challenge? Um, I think I emphasized it a little bit in the presentation, but I think with the stakeholders we have, we all have very different interests. We have different core competencies, and I think we need to lean, we need to learn when to lean on the other partner for, for information, and especially we're bridging a big gap between what we can do technologically as well as what the arts and cultural organizations are about. I mean, that is a big, that was a big learning, I think, for both of us, um, to be able to appreciate what both bring to the table. And you're really bridging a, ga a gap of knowledge. So I think that, that is, that's why communication is. is okay, so d dig into that a bit further then. So, so you're bridging a gap. Um, and my, my personal view on this is that, generally speaking, the technology is, is sort of, is the enabler. And, and in this particular context, it's all about taking the art form and, or the artistic mission or whatever it is to a wider audience or developing it in new ways. How, was it a vocabulary thing? Do you not know how to talk to each other? What were the, what were the symptoms of the problem? Oh, I, would, I definitely say vocabulary is one thing. I mean, we, try, we, we seem to have to explain ourselves two or three times, and that's absolutely fine. Is Let's that because get... you're not very good at explaining yourself? Or is it because... <laughs> no, I think it's because we have a different language okay. when we refer to things. Okay. Um, Sorry, being flippant. No, it's the same thing with content. I think when I talk about content is that we can refer to accession numbers, maybe four or five different ways, and how is it that we're going to represent this content if we don't understand where it's coming from or what it was supposed to do from the very beginning? Um, it can be as simple as let's just put that up there. Do you need it? We have it. No, no, it's really, wh what was the purpose of having it in there in the first place? And are the right users accessing it? Or is it a behind-the-scenes type of enabler? So really having the technology help means understanding comprehensively what we need to do from the very beginning. And how do you go about sort of working to, to work, develop the trust, it sounds like, you need in the relationship? I mean, you know, I've, I've got 15 years of experience and skulls on my back from digital projects. And, but how do, you know, how, do you, how do you build the bonds? Well, I mean, the same way you do you know, with, with everybody, you know, you just, you meet people, you talk to them, you find out what their limitations are, what your limitations are, where the gaps are, who you can kind of fit in, who you can bring in to fit in those gaps. But what I was going to add to, 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 to what was just said was that actually there, there, there are kind of quite a lot now of um, opportunities for people to go out and meet um, other people from different backgrounds in terms of technology backgrounds. So, for example, work that the TSB uh, do in terms of their consortium building projects, work that the Northwest Vision and Media do in terms of uh, um, you know events that they do. I went to one recently with um, a presentation by PACT, who's so a very interesting bridge between. In fact, I know you're involved with it. Bridge it was, between yeah. um, uh, uh, pr producers and distributors, and they're very good. Do great advocacy work for the um, for the sector as well. Um, so just find us, I mean, it's short notice now, and obviously we're entering into the kind of August period too, where everybody's going to be away, and I know in some of the other research projects I'm working on, it's a real problem, actually, the August period. But um, 
but essentially just get yourself out there and go and meet people and um, see who you get on with see where the gaps are in terms of your knowledge and see who you can who you can find to fill those gaps so how do you find Priscilla and Alexandra how do you find the person to fill the gaps project managers producers do you, do you suddenly all have to become sort of pocket geeks I mean how do you actually do it in practice if I may take this one um, well I, I think that actually um, you do end up doing a little bit of everything and I think it is extremely important to actually put yourself in the position of your partners um, and I mean one of the ways I, I think we sort of started bridging this gap um, is that coming from very different points of expertise you know you talk about visuals um, there's nothing like being able to show somebody something and have them tell us it's wrong and and that's really you know one of, one of our approaches in the beginning if we realized it, it's a lot of work but um, it actually will save you time to to just say look just let's try something and then you can tell us whether or not this is the way you want your works represented that you know this is the way you want things um, to, to actually function and your, your user experience. And you know, going back to what Priscilla said earlier about learning from the expertise of your partners, um, I think that's really how we do it. And, and it, that involves you know, having, a, having pro a project um, management plan, but also mm -hmm. making it flexible. Because at the end of the day, there's a lot of coming back and forth. And the more we do it, the better we are at doing it. So there is, there's a huge learning curve on our side as well. Definitely, definitely. I mean, the milestones and scheduling are really important, but you've got to keep flexible. You have to have an aim, you know, steps you want to reach, uh, well, milestones you want to reach. But, I mean, for example, with our, we've had to kind of pour our back end, uh, re redevelop it, basically, because it wasn't reaching the kind of quality standards that we needed it to do. So, you know, that was a milestone we had for, for, for July, but we've kind of had to put it, for, we've had to buy another couple of weeks in terms of our scheduling time out to sort of fix that. So create milestones, create schedules, sure, but don't, be, don't get too sweaty about sort of sitting um, and fix, being fixated on them. Okay, I'm going to come to a question at the back in a second, but just to close off this. So, Priscilla, you mentioned sprints. Mm -hmm. So that's a project, well, it's, it's a project management methodology called Agile, isn't it? Where in which you, you operate in a weekly or bi-weekly, very rapid, you show the thing you've made, you, you look at it, you reiterate it, you do some more work on it, and another couple of weeks you do it again. Because people may have a different experience of sort of waiting 11 months, uh, nine months for a website and then one being sort of born, fully formed in a sort of bloody mess. Um, how are sprints different? I mean, is that the way you would advise people to work on projects and how are they different to that much more sort of structured model? Well, it's worked for us, and I think it goes back to maintaining, having a tool that gives you kind of a structure, but mm, realizing that things do change and adapt to, and, and that we can iterate, and that's the key part, that your process allows you to iterate, allows you to put some feedback in there so it's not so rigid. So yes, it absolutely works for us, um, but I'm sure there are other methods as well. Okay, yeah. so I've got a question up at the back, I think. Thank you. Uh, um, hi, Fiona Gaspar, Royal Exchange Theatre. Hi, Fiona. Um, just a question for Roger, really, and going back to what you said earlier, which was how do you make sure the audiences find, find it? I mean, that, that seems that's to be a, the bit yeah. for me that's missing, really, that there's more and more platforms to show work in different ways and share work in different yeah. ways. But yeah, actually, then, how do, you, how do you really make them useful? How do you make sure people go to that? What's the sort of marketing strategy around that platform, I suppose? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a really, really good question. And it's a really big question as well because it, you know, it's how, it's in some ways what we're doing with the art player platform as a whole is to try and create another plat a platform where people can let's go to, 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 to uh, 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 sort of rambling there, hang on a sec. Ask a question a different way around. Thought there. Ask a different um, way around, might help you. Yeah. Um, how do you differentiate it from YouTube and Vimeo? Because people already go to YouTube, well, so why are they not going for art? Well, so I had an interesting chat with the Tate, Onla uh, Tate Online well, arms group. Are going go on, keep going. Um, and they, basically, a lot of the traffic to their site comes from YouTube and UView, so um, uh, that's, that is actually where the traffic is directed to their site from. Um, we're not building a kind of marketing strategy um, to, to help increase audiences for the whole sector. We're just trying to create a site where people can put their content on. And we will look at how you know, other marketing strategies might work around that. But effectively, um, I don't have an answer to that question. How are you doing it? Because I'm guessing eventually you want to try and be, you are breaking through into commercial at some point. Um, so how do, you, how do you generate traffic for 
both ArtFinder, the site, and the apps and things that you create for individual galleries? What are the tech tip, tips and tra techniques, do you think? Say that with your teeth in. I'll let you talk about the apps part. Um, and then well, I'm coming to a question. And it gets, goes back to partnerships, um, because I think it's in, and we talk about driving traffic, not just physical footfall, but we have a lot of backlinks. So if, I know Alex went through our slides very quickly, but making sure that we have those backlinks, and actually, uh, you know, pulling from the I'm sources. an idiot. Tell me what a backlink is again. It's basically a hyperlink that takes you to, directs you to the right places. Um, it's also how pages are ranked in, in priority for, for Google. So it's good for us to bring in all that, those resources and leverage each other so that traffic comes from different places. We realize that, and that's a good thing, is what I'm saying. Is that as long as you're giving people a, a place to go and knowing that they have all these options, and that's same for the apps. Um, and all that yeah, I think, I think we're very lucky to have um, extremely engaged and enthusiastic partners. Um, and again, you know, we, we sort of have this expertise that goes into a, a much wider and diverse audience, but we also acknowledge that our partners already have an audience in place, mm -hmm. and there's no reason why we shouldn't engage them as well. Mm -hmm. so, so there is a lot of communication going between, you know, between us um, when we make apps or when we actually have you know, more content coming in from partners um, to, to you know, have them help us get the word out that you know, these new products are available and, um, and if you know, their, their general audience is interested, then they can access it easily. And is it, is it paid for marketing this or are you doing it using clever sort of internet techniques? I mean, how has it worked? I was gonna say, we didn't really emphasize the social media aspect. Yeah. Um, and again, it's all over our pages, but Facebook and Twitter, um, being able to allow our users to, to actually share that content is a large part of how the word gets out. So we use Facebook a lot in terms of you log in via your Facebook account, and we all know how people are using that a lot lately, but we make sure that our message gets out through their platform. Mm -hmm. We have Facebook commenting. That's also shared on their platform. So you can see that it just reaches out to very various methods. So I think it's important that we test and try out those social media uh, and let the users drive some of that. Yeah, I mean, that's exactly the approach you know, that we're taking with the Art Player platform as well. I mean, essentially, the partners in this project are all of the organizations in the art sector who have their own marketing strategies for getting their kind of content out there. The site is an aggregator for the kind of content they're creating. So, you know, what I want to see really um, at the end of the project is uh, art, uh, sorry, is um, Twitter, Facebook, and Art Player embedded into their own platform, into their own websites and platforms. So, so it sort of forms a part of the general marketing strategy across the sector to, to uh, engage people or traffic people to the art player platform. Okay. You've been very patient in the middle. Thank you. My question was similar to, to Fiona's, actually. My name's Emma Parsons. I'm a freelance consultant. Um, I've heard a lot of case studies recently from museums and galleries who are using YouTube, uh, and their decision was based on that's where the audiences are now rather than creating a new platform, yeah. use the platform where audiences are already going to. Um, for instance, the Brooklyn Museum and the Guggenheim in New York have been creating their own channels on YouTube. I'm just interested in what the panel think about using existing channels that are already massively used by audiences. Absolutely, rather than creating yeah, absolutely. New platforms. Yeah, you, you, sorry, you've got to absolutely exploit those as well. I mean, most According to the, the, tape, the feedback we got from the tape when we were looking into research in this was that you know, most of their international traffic, their new international traffic, is, po is, is diverted to their website through YouTube. So actually people looking for content go to YouTube first outside of the UK. Um, and we know we're not going to change that no matter how much you throw out a kind of marketing strategy for emerging products. You can't change what people... You know, you can't change the habits that people are, are, are uh, you know, have, have created. So, okay. Okay, so why try to create a platform then, coming from the floor? Well, the platform is a way, is, is one place for all content to get put. So it's, it's a store, effectively, or an archive, or an... Oh, yeah, no, no, you'd use that as well. Okay. Let me repeat that for the camera. Why, why re, um, create a, a place for people to go to, a new place, when they're going somewhere else? Um, why? Uh, well, because we think it's needed, because the, the sector doesn't really support, um, doesn't really have, as I was showing in, the uh, in my presentation, there isn't really 
everybody is not capable of actually doing that. So it, we are creating a platform, but as I was saying, we're also creating services to help create content to support, to support that, that, that platform. Okay. Um, I'm going to come uh, down here. I've got somebody waving a little orange pencil at me. It has been for some time. I mean, if you've got the mic, go on. You go, and then I'll come down here. Uh, I was just Let me direct the mic, if you would, guys, rather than just pause it. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Tekin Suleiman from Crowd FM. Um, Hi. I was just wondering if you could tell us a bit about uh, any difficulties you had in convincing partners to get involved with your projects, particularly museums and galleries. I'm, I mean, what your, your platform obviously has benefits, but the the level of engagement and the level of work required to, to add all the content must be quite large. Uh, how easy was it to convince them to, to be involved? Before you start, within that, can you talk about rights, please? Yeah. Um, I think it was, it was incredibly difficult, especially when we started the project. We didn't have something to show. And I think Alex brought that up um, in that everything is nice conceptually but it was very difficult to kind of persuade. So there has been situations where it's a lot harder. We, we put the idea, we plant the seed, and it takes a lot longer for that to kind of materialize. Then you'll find partners that are willing to take that leap and that chance, and I think that's just trying to find the right fit. And then what happens is once we've got now our platform, we've got our apps, I can tell you it's a lot easier to say, this is what I'm talking about, like, and, and play with it. And that's why I definitely encourage you guys to just touch and feel and see it. So I, I definitely wouldn't discount the fact it is very difficult in the beginning, but I think you'll find partners that are also willing to take the leap because there's nothing out there, or that they are looking for the same kind of synergies as you are. And I think not to, um, not to kind of take a leap forward just for the sake of having a partner, really thinking it through, because that's a, a long-term relationship, or at least you want it to be. So, so how does it work on, on the specifics of rights then? Because from my experience, you would, you would tumble over a moment where everybody tried to decide who owned what you put on the screen. How, how do the deals work without giving commercially confidential things away? Yeah, um, I think with, with image rights, I mean, we deal with picture libraries, museums, galleries, and artists, so you can imagine that it's different for each stakeholder. So some of them will say that the rights belong to me, the rights belong to a third party, you'll need to contact them. So I think it's a matter of just understanding the landscape enough to say, okay, this is where we're, we'll need this particular piece of information, these are the rights, how it's managed, and again, making sure that we, we, we respect the rights okay. exactly the way that they've, they've shared it with and us. Have you found they've fallen into categories? Are they falling into, you know, there are three or four different groups of the ways you deal with this, one in which you pay a, a sort of core rights holder, one in which you revenue share, there the are various different models presumably down the line? Yeah, there, there are various different, yeah. I would say a mixture, yeah. Okay, so that's a useful learning. Go to think about people who've learned about rights. Um, okay, down here, please. Um, Denise Farmy, uh, Arts Council England in Yorkshire. Hello, Denise. Um, I think uh, what is very exciting about Art Player TV is that it does provide an editorial quality level that I don't think you can achieve through YouTube. Um, but the other exciting area around it is that it also provides you with a production team and a skilled production team that can work with your organisation to develop that content and that's what we found through the research that Fact Undertook uh, is lacking in, in arts organisations current profile, web profiles. But what I don't quite understand is presumably you can't uh, apply a licence fee um, to develop Art Player TV and you can't generate huge um, advertising revenues. So what is the business model to continue Art Player as a service for the arts? Yeah. Um, the business, well, effectively the business model is not defined. So we are kind of still in the process of sort of defining what that could be. But where we kind of started with this process of uh, in the Art Player TV platform was with emerging um, opportunities to sort of disseminate content, so effectively IPTV platforms, I think it's in the brochure as well. Um, at the time we started investigating or building the model around how we might actually um, go forward with a platform, we, um, uh, UView was a very much in the um, public consciousness, uh, at that time it was called a Project Canvas, uh, which was an emerging, as I say, I, internet television protocol platform which would require new content. So around that, we thought, well, why not use the um, great kind of um, work which is being created across the sector, capture it, edit it, post it, uh, publish it, and 
have that as a kind of repository for um, some of the content that could be used to create program for IPTV platforms for emerging, to create content for emerging platforms. Now that opens up a kind of Pandora's box of, a, um, of activities and uh, shared, uh, you know, partnerships with creative industry sector to production companies in the air, local, local to the area of the kind of organizations that maybe have a channel on the art player um, platform to create content around and packages uh, that could be, as I say, useful for broadcast purposes. So okay. I suppose that's going to start, that's going to form the, the kind of backbone of our business package in some ways. Okay, we've got lots of people. I've got somebody behind, sort of three quarters of the way back, I think. Angela, have I? Yeah, hello. Hi, um, Claire McKenzie, clairemckenzie.com. Um, questions uh, kind of for Roger. Um, but also, I hope you don't think I'm being facetious, but perhaps a bit of a lifeline as well, because everybody's sort of getting stuck on this YouTube thing. Mm -hmm. Obviously, they are owned by the biggest uh, search engine in the world, so it's going to be very difficult for Art Player to compete in that capacity. Um, I think the training side of it will be very, very useful, because through experience, um, people tend to be very, very unsure of what to do and how to upload content. So I think the strength for you will lie in the, the training side of it. I also think you'll need to be careful about what, um, what content they're uploading in terms yeah. of perhaps advising them and guiding them on that. I think if, you, if they just put up kind of sections of, of performances or you know, whatever their, their sort of activities might be in dance, yeah. I don't think that's going to particularly serve them very well yeah. online. Plus you have a limit for um, how long they can have the films and the videos for. What I do think um, people would be interested in is not overly produced material yeah. that shows what goes on behind the scenes in terms of rehearsals, um, directors, choreography. Um, and I think there's an opportunity perhaps mm. there. Absolutely, I totally, yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's effectively what we're providing is an assisted service, which is self-managed. So the fact is, or sorry, the Art Player TV administrative team, if you like, if this rolls out further, is not going to kind of um, babysit every channel or every organisation that's kind of uh, submitting content to their to their channel within the site. Um, but we will we will be offering assistance around production, around dissemination, um, around the relationships we have with maybe other production companies um, to, help for, to help them create, create that content. I do think the YouTube thing is a bit of a red herring because I think that's gonna happen kind of anyway. And as I said, you know, um, the, um, the Tate get a lot of their new traffic through, through that kind of uh, route. Um, so yeah, it's, it is, it's, it's that, it's an assisted service which is self-managed because no one organisation could um, oversee the, um, the entire sector in terms of what content they publish. Um, that's impossible. Okay, just here. Um, Manus Carey from Camerato again. Um, I have kind of a two-part question just to pick up on the whole business plan thing. Uh, we do a lot of live streaming ourselves and it's incredibly expensive. Mm -hmm. And it's an, ex an incredibly expensive thing to set up websites and to do all the, all the work and create all the partnerships. And I was just wondering, um, are you tr both trying to create websites, platforms that stand alone and are something in themselves, or that are there to lead on to the organizations involved? And if, if the second is the case, how do you do that? So if I'm a gallery or whatever, how can I ensure that if I'm involved that your website leads to me? And then the second question is, do either of you have any interest in um, creating any kind of income? Because there must be a massive amount of cost. And have you discussed you know, ways to, to, to generate any income? OK, let's do Art Finder on those questions. So the, how do you drive traffic back to people's websites? Or is it just about you? And then where does the, where does the money come into this? Um, so the first part, driving traffic, we talked about that. And I think one of the ways of attracting our partners is to say that we're going to give you the, the, the stats behind that to say, because we can say where and how we're directing people to the site, and actually in particular, which pages even. So I think giving the, that, those insights as to who's coming to the site, what are they looking at, I mean, that's valuable customer information. And being able to share that with them and say, and we're, then we're directing them from our previous discussions to maybe your print-on-demand 
you know, we'll do an affiliate kind of link there, or do you want them to go towards the exhibition? And I guess, again, being nimble enough to understand where the traffic is really flowing and adjusting it so that it's actually what you want or best for the user. So that information is definitely something we work with our partners to provide. So I hope like that that's... If I can more. actually add to that as yep. well, I mean, our entire concept of, um, of, of being able to explore art and share art includes exactly linking people to our partners. I mean, you have no other way of experience live art until you actually go to an exhibition, go to a museum. Um, so that is, that is at the very core of what we're trying to do with our website. Is it too early to know whether that's actually working? So the Constable app, so how would you track whether or not people had downloaded the app and then showed up more to the National Gallery? For instance, it is I know it's quite early, but how would you theoretically, how would you go about it? Um, I mean, we, we, we can track these things, and there are ways to track it through, you know, the people that we build and sell the apps uh, through, but it is, it is very early. So we could, you, could, we, you could, for instance, give a special access code or a discount voucher, or it's not a discount, you give a free cup of coffee to people who showed up. Yeah. for instance, to track. So you could be yeah, sort of slightly and, and, counterintuitive about it. And we are trying, I mean, we are trying very different things. I mean, we have apps that are, or we have different, well, I'll, I'll speak to apps because I know sure. more about that. But um, we have different models as to how we create them. And depending on your exhibition amount of content that you want to put in an app, um, some of our partners, for example, have decided that, well, we'll do, we'll do sort of a sample um, you know, app that, that opens up your taste to, to the full thing. Um, and other, other partners, you know, have promotional giveaways. So it's really, I mean, as, as a company that's not very old, we are still, still sort of testing which one of these strategies work best. Mm. I sure. think that the key part, the benefit of the, the digitization it, and that putting that stuff on the web gives you insights, deeper insights than you would having to measure people coming into your gallery and museum and they've, they've looked at something, you don't know what they've looked at. Whereas let's say we have our smartphone image recognition, you take, you know what that image is, you've kind of captured it, it's in your profile now, you can go back and revisit it. You can look at that one image 10 more times and we know you've seen it like 20 times and maybe you're interested in that particular artist. And so that, that, that's really valuable kind of insights to recommending and, and, and directing users where they want to go. So yeah, I think Definitely crucial, and when building a plan, it's important to have those metrics. Okay, and, and how does money get made in any of this, and would you revenue share it, or what would happen if there is any? I assume that it should, must be at some point, otherwise you're going to be receiving grants for a long yeah. time. Yeah, uh, well, we talked about print-on-demand, um, and that definitely there's some revenue sharing involved in that, and we talked about um, at the apps as well. Um, Alex mentions hate taster apps, as well as, let's say, you get a taste of it, you want, let's say, more images, higher resolution. Um, apps nowadays are not expensive, so especially when you're going to a museum and gallery and buying a guide, you might just want that guide on your handheld versus trying to peer through and finding that, that place card. Get that, all that information at your fingertips. So there's various okay. ways, I would say. So a partner might pay you for an app, or you might share the revenue from creating one together. Exactly. Okay. Okay. I've got a question waiting here, and then I'm going to do one more, and then we're done. Um, Hi. Uh, Joe Bicato from Anti Limited. Just coming back to the commercials, that's what I've been most interested in, because probably everybody in the room here has got great ideas or great needs. But one of the things at the beginning of this session was we were told about um, innovation in terms of income generation, in terms of revenue uh, streaming. Mm -hmm. And I've been struggling to understand exactly how some of the people that you're providing products or services to will help you to derive revenue beyond being self-funded or grant-funded. We've just touched upon it in some of the answers, but I'm still struggling to understand how there is necessarily a viable, scalable business model um, with the the great ideas that you have. Mm. So how do you convert okay. an idea I mean, into from, something? Sorry, uh, so from from our point, from art player's point of view, the business model is the the only really exploitable um, con um, business model. Uh, well, asset that we have is the content that we create, the things that we do, um, and the the more things that we do, the better we do it. The more likely we can redeploy that content elsewhere. For for are, because we're creating new content and possibly also posting up sort of existing content through people's archives, um, we're able to start looking at building models around, as I said before, around production services, uh, creative industries that create a um, program for broadcast, for distribution. So those are the sort of models that we're kind of looking at, I think. Hooking up with local as I said earlier, local production houses to organizations in the, in, in the area of the organizations that have got the channels on the site. 
and, and as I say, redeploying it to, to create good, good quality program which can then be sold locally, nationally, globally, wherever we can. That's, that's what's formed the basis of our kind of business modeling around it, I think. Uh, sort of, I, I get that, but um, do you not have high overheads? If you're looking at hosting, streaming, or uh, other video content, how do you kind of amortize the uh, high overheads you may have on one side of the business yeah. against the knowledge economy or the service provision that you're tending to yeah. Uh, offer? Yeah, I mean, we're not intending to do streaming through the site. That's not one of our kind of aims, although the broadcast group, who are one of our partners, are looking at models around streaming. I mean, there are, there are organizations within the UK and, and groupings of organizations, and the, the Cross Art Form Venue Network is, is one of them, where they're looking at ways to distribute um, content through cinema, digital cinema networks, so ticketed sales for um, new content that's emerging out of these developing platforms. Um, in some ways, that CAVN network uh, the, um, it grew out of the work that the NT Live project uh, indicated and, and, and the revenue models that they published around that were, were very, were, as far as I could gather, were really actually very successful. So there, there are new, dis there's sort of emerging distribu distribution models for creative content um, and program, which, will, you know, which I think are exploitable. Okay, so uh, with you guys, I think I'm spotting various models. I'm spotting a kind of white label apps development. This is for you as opposed to your partners. So I've got a white label, you make apps, and then you can sell them into partners or revenue share on apps. You've got traffic coming through a website, which is potentially, if you wanted to, got advertising value. You've got various referral revenue. Tell me if I'm wrong, like print on demand. You may have even ticketing on demand for big events, that sort of stuff. Um, what's your, your partners are getting what? They're getting their shares of that. They're potentially getting more footfall through the, the gallery where they might charge or they might be able to measure against their grant funding applications. What have I missed? I'm just trying to get through this quickly. I think I got quite a lot of that. Okay, there you go. That's how Art Founder works, and I should be investing later. I know. No, I won't. Um, okay, I, but I think these are what's very interesting about sort of both. They're coming from different places to the same sort of set of questions. Um, because you're. I think I'm right in saying you had a, uh, an R&D innovation sort of grant initially, right. and the plan is to become a commercialised entity, whereas you're living more in the public, spe public sector, sector space to some degree. So you can't kind of expect them to be the same, um, to, to particularly. Um, OK, I've got one last question, and then we're going to have our lunch, because I, for one, need a sandwich. Um, this is kind of um, to Art Finder. Um, my question is, in terms of would you partner up with maybe private gallery spaces or groups of artists and would they then be able to sell their products within the platform because I would really like to do that. <laughs> okay, so we've got a business deal going on across the room. <laughs> okay, so that's a kind of, that's a, so I didn't get that one, thank you very much. Um, so can, can you do that? Will you do that? Is that a good idea? So there's a really long answer to that. Yes. Can we have the really short version of the really long one because I really do need a sandwich? Now go on. <laughs> Um, yes, I mean, and, and we spoke a little bit about... <laughs> <laughs> Great, so lunch. No, um, I, I, let's take the private conversation offline. The answer is clearly yes, um, um, and it's a really important sort of, sort of area, but let's um, let them have their, their quiet conversation. Um, um, we are running a little bit late, and I hate that in conferences. I'm sure you do. Um, there we go. Thank you so much um, to, uh, to Roger, to Priscilla, to Alexandra for, I think, a very illuminating session. 